Today's session is going to be recorded, so if you would like to refer back to anything we discussed today, or if you have colleagues who weren't able to join us, a recording will be posted on the CultureWorks website, cultureworks.org, by the end of the week. A couple quick notes about the logistics of today's meeting. If you're attend an attendee, you are set to listen only mode. So you can't use your microphone or your video, but I do want to make sure that I answer your questions. So if you hover your mouse close to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a few different buttons pop up. One of them should look like the quote bubbles out of a cartoon. Uh, it'll say Q&A. And if you click on that, you can send questions to me throughout the presentation. So feel free to do that. I'll try to answer some as we go, but I'll also save a little bit of time at the end to cover anything that I didn't get to uh, in the slides. As a uh, one other minor note, I am recovering from a little bit of a sickness here, so I'm a bit hoarse, and if I suddenly mute myself uh, and go off camera, it is to spare you the grisly details of that. But um, I will uh, try to get back as quickly as possible. All right, so today we are here to talk again about the 2023-2024 Special Projects Grant. And this program is a private public partnership between two organizations. One of those is the organization that I represent, CultureWorks, and we are an organization that advocates and fundraises for arts and culture in the eight county Dayton region. The funder of this program is the Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, or MCACD, as you'll hear them called throughout uh, the session today. And they're a special unit of Montgomery County government that was created 30 years ago by the Board of Commissioners to support arts and culture in Montgomery County, primarily through providing funding to the community's major arts and cultural organizations. Both the MCACD and CultureWorks believe that the arts are essential to the health of individuals and communities, so we work together on a number of programs and initiatives to build the arts and cultural community here uh, together. The program we're here to talk about today, the Special Projects Grant, we launched back in 2020 uh, with the intention of supporting specific arts and cultural projects within Montgomery County that benefit Montgomery County residents. And before we get into the details of the Special Projects Grant, we want to make sure that we thank and acknowledge the Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District and our Board of Montgomery County Commissioners for providing the funding for this program and making it possible. Um, we we are so lucky to be in a community that invests in the arts and we're grateful to have Montgomery County leadership that recognizes the importance and impact of arts and culture. So the Special Projects Grant, as I mentioned, and as the name suggests, it's designed to support arts and cultural projects that are happening in the Montgomery County community. And in the, the last three years since it launched, more than 47 organizations have been awarded over $550,000 for projects, many of which you are probably already familiar with. Um, so the program has supported the creation of original theatrical and musical productions, such as Theater Lab Dayton's Charlie and Doggy and the Song at the Edge of the World that you see pictured there at the bottom. Exhibitions like the African American Visual Artist Guild's Black Heritage Through Visual Rhythms, which was at the Dayton Art Institute. Arts and Education programs like Dayton Literary Peace Prize's Student Author Series. Public art like the mural that you see here in the city of Vandalia, which uh, celebrates the city's designation as Ohio's first bee city and many new and established community events like Art in the City, the Hispanic Heritage Festival, and the Dayton Jewish Film Festival. In terms of the types of organizations who can apply for funding, it's open to a broad variety. So of course, arts and cultural nonprofits, but also social services nonprofits, as well as schools, colleges, universities, municipalities, and government agencies. Uh, so your organization doesn't need to have an arts and cultural focus to apply for funding through this program. You just need to propose a project that is arts and cultural in nature. 
And we also want to make sure that we are supporting the work of new and emerging grassroots organizations and artist collectives. So if your organization operates as a nonprofit, but you don't have 501c3 status, you can still apply for the program, but you'll need to do so in partnership with a fiscal agent. Uh, and that's going to be usually a larger, uh, more established nonprofit organization, a 501c3, who's going to accept the grant funds on your behalf and then oversee the use of those funds as you complete your project. You do need to be a Montgomery County organization. Uh, again, this is a publicly funded program. So the funding from the MCACD comes from sales tax revenues from Montgomery County residents. So we wanna make sure that the projects that those funds are supporting are benefiting the community that are making them possible. And this program isn't open to um, arts and cultural organizations or their auxiliary or satellite organizations that already receive operating support through the Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District. So that probably doesn't apply to most of you in the room. Um, it's a totally separate grant program through the MCACD, but if you are already receiving funds there, then you can't apply for the special projects funding. Again, this is open to nonprofit organizations and the other types of entities described above. So it isn't open to for-profits. So if you're a for-profit LLC uh, or small business, um, you aren't eligible to apply for this program, but there are a lot of great resources in the community and um, feel free to reach out to us and we can help connect you with some of them. And also, it is an organizational grant, so it isn't open to individual artists. But if you are an individual artist and you have a project that you want to do solo, uh, check back with us because later in the summer we'll launch the next round of another program called the Artist Opportunity Grant. Um, and that provides funding for artists to complete new work and pursue professional development opportunities. So just get in touch with us. We've probably got other fundings that will be a better fit for you. So if your organization does fit those basic eligibility requirements, uh, then there are a lot of different types of projects that you can apply for uh, through this program. This year, the MCACD is providing $300,000 for this grant cycle. So that's an increase from past years. When we launched the program in 2020, we had $150,000. Last year, they increased it to 250, dollars And this year, they've increased, increased it to $300,000. So that just shows um, how strongly Montgomery County believes in the importance of this program and arts and culture in general. So again, thank you to them for uh, entrusting us with these funds and um, supporting so many amazing projects. Your organization can apply for up to $10,000 of that funding for an arts and cultural project that's going to happen in Montgomery County between July 1st of this year and June 30th of next year. Your projects can be any uh, arts and cultural type of project. I gave you some examples earlier. Um, they also can be things that you have never done before, or they could be repeat projects. So maybe your organization has been doing the same event for a number of years, um, but you want to do a refresh or do a different theme for this year. Um, so it doesn't have to be reinventing the wheel. It just has to be something that you can demonstrate is a true project. It has a, a definite start date and a definite end date that's going to happen within that next fiscal year. And in terms of the types of projects, we will ask you to put your project into one of these categories. So cultural or multi-arts refers to projects that incorporate a, a number of different artistic disciplines. So for example, festivals or symposiums where there's going to be dance and music and spoken word, that would usually fall under that category. Education kind of speaks for itself, uh, but we love seeing arts and education projects where you're bringing artists into classrooms and helping students reach learning objectives through the arts. That's really powerful. Literary and performing arts and visual arts projects, of course. And then last year, we added a new project category called capacity building. <laughs> This project category, um, I, I'll give you a little more detail about it, is it's the only one that's only open to arts and cultural nonprofits. So any type of nonprofit can apply for any of those other categories, but you do have to be arts and cultural focused to apply for capacity building. And the reason for that 
is that capacity building projects are projects that are they're short term, but they have long term impact on an organization's ability to carry out its mission. So usually when we're talking about capacity building, uh, we're talking about things like strategic planning efforts. So an organization is ready for a new five year plan and they want to bring in a consultant to help guide their staff and board through a strategic planning process. That's a great way to build your organization's capacity to keep going and keep growing. Maybe you have team members who are really great at what they do, but they would be even stronger in their roles with additional training and skills. So you could do a capacity building project where you're going to provide those professional development opportunities for your team members. Maybe your organization is in need of a rebrand or you have an outdated website and you're struggling to reach audiences and, and uh, engage the community in your arts and cultural projects because you can't reach them through your website or through your current marketing materials. So you want to hire a website developer or a marketing firm to help you do an overhaul. That would be a, a great use of capacity building funding. And finally, if your organization is thinking about uh, trying a new type of programming, but you're not sure whether it's in line with what your community wants, maybe before you, you hit the ground running, you want to do a market research study or a feasibility study to see uh, whether or not this particular type of program makes sense for your community. That's another use for capacity building funds. But as you can tell, these types of projects don't have specific arts and cultural outcomes. So that's why you have to be an arts and cultural organization to use the funding for capacity building. Um, a good rule to follow when you're thinking about a capacity building project is that uh, capacity building is about building your organization's skills and toolbox, but it's not about your organization's building. So you can't use funding for any kind of capital expenses, which are defined as uh, purchasing, repairing, or maintaining land buildings or equipment. Um, so you can't use any, any of the special projects funds for facility expenses and that type of thing. So um, again, this is a project category that we just added last year, and we were really excited. We got a great response to it. A lot of organizations uh, did use the funding for this project category. So if you want to see the types of things that other organizations have applied for in this area, we do have a list of all of the um, past grantees on the CultureWorks website that you can check out if you're trying to kind of get some ideas. So a lot of people will ask what kinds of expenses people use the grant funds for, and these are just a few examples. The funding can be applied in a lot of different areas of your project budget, but often we see organizations use grant funds to support the cost of artist fees. So if you're hosting a festival or a concert and you want to hire performers, you could use the grant funds to pay those performers. Absolutely pay your artists. If you need to rent a venue, whether it's for rehearsal space or the actual performance itself, those kinds of venue rental fees are allowable. Any kind of supplies related to the creation of the art, um, of course, often things like paint and canvases come to mind, but also if you need to, say, create costumes and you're going to need uh, fabrics and things like that, those would all be allowable supplies. And then also outside services and fees. So again, if you want to hire um, a marketing professional to help out with getting the word out about your project, you could use funds to pay them. If you need to hire production crew or lighting technicians, fees, you could pay their fees with the grant funds. And then staff time. Uh, the staff time does have to be specific to this project. So you can't use grant funds just to you know, pay somebody for their regular daily duties. But if a member of your staff is going to be using a set number of hours to make this project happen, you can pay those hours with the grant funds. Pardon me. Stay healthy, everybody. So uh, there is no matching funding requirement for nonprofit organizations or K through 12 schools um, who apply for the program. Uh, we want to, we know that a lot of, especially smaller and mid-sized nonprofits are working with pretty, pretty restricted budgets. Um, so you can apply for $10,000 and that can cover the entire cost of your project.
If you're one of these larger types of organizations or institutions, a college, university, a municipality, or a government agency, we will require you to provide a one-to-one -one cash match. So if you're requesting $10,000 and you're one of these types of organizations, you're going to have to show that your total project budget is at least $20,000 and you have um, $10,000 to match that grant request. That said, it can come from your organization's own budget, or it could be from another funding source. So maybe you get another $10,000 grant from a different funder, and you could apply that to your match. Applicants can only apply for one project per cycle, and you can only submit one application per project. What this means is um, if your organization will be collaborating with another organization, you're both going to be working on the project, only one of you can apply for funding for that project. It gets too complicated if we get more than one application for the same project, because then when we get uh, into the panel review process that we'll talk about later. The panelists have to think about if we if we only fund one of these applications, can the project still move forward? And it's and it's unfair to other applicants who are only submitting one application. So, um, and then the last kind of frequently asked question that we often get is whether there's any kind of final report. And the answer is yes. So if your organization is selected for funding, then you are going to you're going to tell us your project's start date and end date, and you'll have a final report that's due 30 days after whatever that project end date is. We're going to take a look at, in greater detail at the intent to apply and some of the application uh, pieces and elements um, in a moment here, but first to give you a sense of how the overall application process works, it happens in two main phases. The first is the one that kicked off today, the intent to apply phase. So starting today, you can go to the CultureWorks website and you can start this intent to apply form that's going to be due March 3rd at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The intent to apply is a very simple short form where you're going to give us a quick snapshot of who your organization is and a general idea of the project that you want to apply for. You don't have to get into specifics and details at this point. We mostly want to um, make sure that your organization and your project are eligible and fit within the program guidelines before you invest the time in that full application. So after the intent to apply deadline on March 3rd, all of the intent to apply forms will be reviewed by CultureWorks and MCACD staff to check for basic eligibility. And then we'll reach out to you at the, uh, in late March to let you know if you're eligible to complete the full application. And we'll send you instructions at that time um, on how to access the application and things to, things to keep in mind. If your organization is eligible to complete the full application, the full application will be due on April 26th, also at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Following the application deadline, CultureWorks and the MCACD staff will do another initial review of your applications, again, just checking for eligibility, and then eligible applications will be sent to a, an independent grant panel. So this is going to be a group of arts administrators, artists, and other leaders from Montgomery County and the surrounding counties who will read all of the applications, score them using an established rubric, and then come together at a public meeting where they'll discuss the applications um, and make their funding determinations. If you've never been to a panel meeting before, they are again open to the public. We encourage applicants to attend because it gives you an opportunity to hear specific feedback from the grant reviewers on what worked really well in your application and areas where they had questions and where you could improve in future application cycles. The panelists discuss the applications one at a time and we do send you a schedule in advance so that you know uh, an estimated time when your application will be discussed if you only want to sign on for that part of the meeting. At the end of the meeting, the panelists go into a closed session 
where they review uh, or they submit their final scores and then they review the applicants ranked from highest average score to lowest average score. And they're going to use that ranking to make their funding determinations. So this year, uh, as I mentioned before, we have $300,000 to award. Panelists can choose to award the full $300,000 if they feel that there are enough uh, strong competitive project proposals, but they aren't required to use the full $300,000. In most grant cycles, um, it is competitive. We do get more funding requests than we have funding available. So uh, sometimes panelists will also choose to award partial funding to some organizations. So if your organization requests $10,000 and you have an exceptional application, it's really strong, then there's a good likelihood that the panel is going to award you that full $10,000. But if your application raised some questions or they had concerns, or if there are just so many amazing applications that they can't fully fund all of them, they might award uh, a partial grant. So they might give you 7,500 instead of 10,000 or 5,000 instead of 10,000. Uh, so typically, again, those partial awards will be awarded if they don't have enough funding to go around or to reflect the quality of the applications. The um, at the end of that grant panel meeting, applicants will know right away whether they've been recommended for funding or not, and then you'll receive follow up communications where we will um, provide you with your grant agreement, do an onboarding meeting with you to talk through the next steps, and then the first grant payments will uh, start going out in July of 2023. We award grants in two installment payments. The first is 75% of your grant award and we send you that um, 30 days before your project starts. And the remaining 25% of the grant is paid after you submit your final report. And then all projects will have to be wrapped up by June 30th of uh, 2024. Now we want to make sure that you have the best shot possible of having an amazing application and getting full funding. So we do have a few opportunities where applicants can get more support as you're shaping your projects and your applications. One of those is coming up starting next week, and those are a series of project ideation sessions. So these are very quick, informal 15 minute meetings where you can drop in and talk with a CultureWorks or MCACD staff member about your very very basic project idea. And the purpose of these sessions is so that um, we can tell you whether it sounds like you're on the right track or not. We can ask you some questions um, and give you some, some suggestions and things to think about as you're shaping your project. So again, they're very quick and informal. There's a page or there's a sign up link on the CultureWorks website that I'll drop into the chat in just a bit. And then uh, something we're adding this year is if your organization is eligible to complete the full application, you'll have the opportunity to submit a draft for review. Um, the deadline to do that will be April 12th, so a couple weeks before the final application deadline. And the draft is going to be reviewed by either a member of CultureWorks or MCACD staff or by an outside grant consultant that we bring on. And um, whoever reviews your draft will put together written feedback for you that they'll send to you um, at least a week before the application deadline so that you have time to uh, take their suggestions in and incorporate some of those into that final application to make sure that it's uh, super polished. And we'll provide more instructions on how to submit a draft for review if you'd like to take advantage of that once we get to the application phase. So stay tuned. Let me see if we had any questions so far. Okay. I want to make sure that you feel comfortable with submitting the intent to apply form. So we're going to take a quick tour of the online system. Both the intent to apply and the application will be submitted online through a website called EC Impact, which is a grant application site that the, the county uses for a lot of programs. So let me switch my screen over here. All right, 
If you go to the CultureWorks website, cultureworks.org, starting today, you can access the intent to apply form. So um, on the apply for funding page of our website, we list all of the programs uh, that uh, you can apply for. And you're going to want to make sure you find the special projects grant. So if you're on a desktop, it'll be in this uh, shortcut menu bar at the top. If you're on mobile, you'll just have to kind of scroll down until you find it. But all of the information about this program is posted here. And if you keep scrolling, 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 eventually you'll get to this section where there's a nice bright orange button that says start an intent to apply. And clicking on that will take you to the EC Impact website. The homepage is going to look like this. And um, if you've never applied before, if, or if you've never used EC Impact before, the first thing you'll have to do is create an EC Impact account. So you'll see that down here. And that'll show you the grant opportunities that are currently accepting applications on this site. So Special Projects is right up here. There's also a new grant program that I'll, I'll mention at the end uh, to keep an eye out for. You'll just click next and then you'll get to this form and I just want to highlight a couple things because sometimes the the terms that are used on this page are a little confusing for people so. At, at this stage you're just going to provide basic information about your organization when it says provider name that means the name of your organization uh, provider and agency are words that you'll see used in a few places in the application system, um, but those just mean organization. If it's marked with an asterisk, it means that it's required. If it's not, then you don't have to fill it out. So you can skip a lot of this next section here, but I do recommend including at least your mission statement and your vision statement. And from there, it's just basic contact information and then the login information that you want to use. Once you have completed this, you'll just hit next until it tells you that your registration is complete and you're ready to go. So once you've got your account set up, you'll use this sign in button here. And it'll look something like this. Mine is an administrative test account, so it's going to have more stuff on it than your home page will, but this at least gives you a sense. So on your home page, you'll see the special projects intent to apply section here. It looks like this. You can also find forms using this left hand navigation uh, menu, but if you use this just make sure that you're uh, going to the right program. The Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District does operate several grant programs, so you'll also see those listed here. Like these are the ones for their operating support, so you don't want to stray into the wrong uh, grant program accidentally. So make sure it should say Special Projects 2023. To start your intent to apply, there will be a button here that will say click here to start or click here to continue working if you've already started. And on the next page, it'll show you all of the forms that are associated with this process. So for the intent to apply, it's just one form. It looks like this. And it'll tell you uh, whether you've started it or not, whether you're ready to submit, or whether, whether you've actually submitted your form. If you click on it, it takes you to the form itself. Some of this information will already be filled in based on the information you put in when you created your account. And then, as I promised, the intent to apply is very, it's very short and sweet. Um, you're going to tell us what type of organization you are. And uh, so if you're a 501c3, that means you're a nonprofit organization incorporated at the state level and you have federal tax exemption. If you are one of those organizations who doesn't have your own nonprofit status, um, so you're not incorporated and you don't have the federal tax exemption, then you are going to be applying with a fiscal agent. So you can tell us that here. For the intent to apply, if you already know the organization who's going to serve as your fiscal agent, you can tell us that here. But if you don't know them, uh, know who it will be yet, that's okay too. You can just click no, or you'll just leave this blank. Um, but just keep in mind that when you get to the full application later on, you'll have to tell us who the fiscal agent is, and you'll need to provide a letter of agreement showing the um, the 
the role that each organization is going to play in the project and the fiscal agent's going to say, you know, yes, we're serving as the fiscal agent and here's what our responsibilities are. So you don't have to worry about that for intent to apply, but just make sure that it's on your to-do list for the full application. And then for the project itself, you can tell us the name of your project. You can always change this later. When it's expected to happen, so your start and end date. Is it a new project or repeat project? And for the purposes of the intent to apply, what we're asking for here is whether the project has received MCACD funding before. So um, next to a lot of these questions, you'll see this green question mark. And if you hover over it, it gives you more information to tell you exactly what we're looking for here. So if your project has never received MCACD funding, you'll say it's a new project. And here is where you'll tell us your funding request, so how much um, you are asking for. And again, you can ask for up to $10,000. We also want to know the total project budget. So for many nonprofits, uh, your project budget might be the same as the funding request. Your project will cost $10,000, and you're hoping that you're going to get that full $10,000 from the grant. That's perfectly fine. If you're one of those larger institutions, like a college or university, and you are going to have to provide matching funding, then your total project budget is going to be at least um, twice as much as whatever your funding request is. And then here we get a lot of questions about this one, total agency budget. So this means total organization budget. And this is um, basically what you would report on your uh, tax forms each year. So usually organizations will look at their form 990 line 12, which is the earned and contributed revenues that your organization got in the last fiscal year. And there's no right or wrong answer here. We're not scoring. Um, we're not scoring you based on how big or how small your organization's budget is. We just want to see how this project fits into the larger scope of what your organization is doing. Then you'll tell us the type of project, fit it into one of those categories that I mentioned earlier, and give us a project summary and an explanation of how you'll use the requested funds. But again, for the intent to apply, this really is a summary. You don't have to have all of the details nailed down. Just tell us um, in general, we want to have this type of an event. This is the location we're planning, and this is when it's going to happen. And then how you're going to use the requested funds doesn't need to be a detailed itemized budget at this point. Um, you can just tell us the general budget areas where you're planning to use the grant funds so that we can make sure that uh, it fits within the rules. So for example, we plan to use the special projects grant to uh, pay for a marketing firm to market the project or to pay venue fees and artist fees, those kinds of basic budget buckets. Now, this is very important. As you're completing your intent to apply and later as you're completing your application, make sure that every once in a while you go to the bottom here and you click Save My Work, and it'll tell you that it's been saved. And when you're ready to submit, you're happy with all of your responses, you have to click Save My Work and Mark as Completed. If you don't mark a section as completed, it won't let you submit. So I'm done. I'm going to click that. And now you'll see it has switched my form status to ready to submit. So once you're ready to submit that intent to apply or later on your application, there's one last step. It'll ask where you want the confirmation email to go. So you'll just fill in whatever email address you want the submission confirmation to go to. And then you're going to certify that the information you're submitting is true and correct to the best of your knowledge. Check that. And then click Submit. And you'll get an email right away letting you know that it went through. So as I mentioned, the application will um, be submitted through the same website. So if you go to your home page, um, Currently, you won't see the application because it's not open yet, but I get to see it because I'm an administrator. So <clears throat> it'll look like this, same exact setup. 
but you will notice that in the application section, there are going to be more sections than the intent to apply. The application is a, a fuller picture of your project, so there are going to be more questions and more sections. Um, the first section is that special projects application. That's where all of those narrative questions are. The second section is called statistical information. And this is where you're telling us the number of people who are involved in your project. So how many staff people, how many volunteers, how many artists, and then your expected audiences. We know that these are just estimates, but we want to get a sense of the size of the audience for your project. Whoops. And then a project budget. Again, this is only part of the full application, so you don't have to have this ready for the intent to apply. But just to show you what it looks like so that you feel prepared, uh, we do provide a form. So you don't have to create a spreadsheet. It also does the auto calculations for you. So you don't have to do math. You just have to put in the numbers, um, which I know for someone like me is, uh, is great. <laughs> so the budget form looks like this. And it's broken into some of those categories I talked about before. So um, your personnel expenses are the people who are going to be involved in making the project happen, who are part of your organization. Outside fees. This is anyone who you are hiring from outside of your organization. So those performers that don't work for your organization, you're just hiring them for this project. They're going to be under outside fees artistic. Maybe you have a technical or production person you're hiring on, and so on. Marketing and publicity is an allowable expense area. Uh, anything involving the production of the project. So if you're making any kind of handouts that people are going to receive at the exhibition, if you need to rent equipment, all that good stuff. Facilities rentals, so those rehearsal and venue spaces that we talked about. Accessibility. Uh, we want to make sure that anything that at the MCACD and this, prog this program are funding are accessible to a broad variety, a diverse um, audience. So if your organization is going to um, have accessibility features in your project, like you're hiring an ASL interpreter, for example, for your performance, you might include those costs under accessibility. And then remaining expenses. And to put numbers into each of these, you'll just click on the name of the expense category, and it'll take you to this smaller little spreadsheet that you'll fill out. The first column, Special Projects Grant, this is where you're putting any expenses that the grant is going to cover. So again, it might be all of them. If you're asking for 10000 and the project costs 10000 all of your expenses might go in the special projects grant column. But if you have other funding sources that, that are going to support some of these expenses, you'll put them in that other cash expenses column. And if you have any in-kind support, so in-kind support is where uh, someone is donating materials or services. Um, so you're not paying for them, you're getting them um, at no cost to you, but they have a value. You'll put that in this in-kind expenses column. And again, the system will add all of this up together for you so you don't have to do that. And then at the bottom of your budget, we're also going to ask you for the project's income. So this is going to be um, the amount that you expect that you're going to, to make from the project. So if you're charging tickets or you're charging admission fees, how much do you think you're going to raise through those ticket sales and admission fees? And then do you have any other contributed income supporting the project? So do you have a business or a foundation who's providing funding? Do you have donations from individuals that are going to support the project? And then you'll put the amount of the special projects grant request um, here. Something that's really kind of throws people off every year is that for this budget, we want to see a balanced budget. That means that the amount that you're spending equals the amount that you're bringing in. So at the bottom here, you'll see that there's this surplus or deficit that reads at zero. 
And this is what we want to see, that the amount you're spending equals the amount that you're bringing in. But this is just for budgeting purposes. We know that your project, uh, if you're funded and then you complete the project, you might end up with a surplus. That's great. There's no penalty for that. Um, you might end up with a deficit. And we hate to see that, but we know that it happens. But for planning purposes, we want you to be planning for uh, a break-even budget. And the reason for that is, if, for example, your budget tells us that this project is going to have a surplus of $50,000, that raises questions of whether or not this grant is really um, needed for your organization or how impactful it's really going to be if you're expecting to, to raise that amount of money. And of course, if we see that you're planning for a deficit, that might raise some concerns about whether or not the project is feasible. So happy to answer any other questions about that as you as you go along, but I want to put some of these things uh, out there up front. I'm going to pause because I saw we got some questions, so let me take a look here real quick. Okay, so I have a few questions. I'm going to pause before we go to the next section here and answer. So one was the uh, page where you sign up for an account on EC Impact says that a website URL is required. If your organization doesn't have a website, unfortunately, I think it does force you to put something in that field. Um, maybe you could put the the if you have a Facebook profile or something like that just to get some information in there. Um, Someone asked for clarification about a fiscal agent. So that's that's a great question. Um, so if your organization, you you're not a business, you're not a for-profit business, you operate as a nonprofit, but you are not a 501c3. So the you don't have um, federal tax exemption. Usually this is going to be groups who are things like grassroots groups or again artist collectives. Um, you have to have 501c3 status to receive grant funding as an organization. So what uh, these like smaller and emerging grassroots groups will do is they'll approach another organization that has 501c3 status um, and ask them to serve as what's called a fiscal agent. And what the fiscal agent does is they, um, they basically extend their tax exemption status to you for this project. So the fiscal agent is going to be the one who actually receives the grant funds, but your organization is going to actually do the project. So the fiscal agent organization receives the grant dollars, they, they hold those funds, and then they, they give your organization the funds as you're completing your project so that they can make sure that you're spending them uh, according to the grant rules. So basically, they're there to provide some financial oversight uh, and to provide that, that tax exempt status. We can definitely talk about that more. If you are an organization who's going to be looking for a fiscal agent, we're happy to, happy to answer questions about that. And then someone asked, will the recording be accessible? And yes, it absolutely will. So I'll send out an email to anyone who registered once that video is posted on our website so that you know where to find it. All right. Now, rather than go through the entire application uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to look at the full application today. But I do think it's important for you to know ahead of time how projects are evaluated and selected for funding. So um, the grant panel that makes the funding decisions, as I mentioned before, they use an established scoring rubric. It's 100 points. Uh, it's the maximum score you can receive. And those 100 points are broken pretty evenly into three big scoring areas. So the first is project quality and artistic vibrancy. And this is where panelists are looking at the quality of the activities that you're planning to do. Um, so, and also the quality of the artists or creative personnel who are involved in the project. Uh, the 
second area which is um, has the most points by a little bit is community impact and engagement so again this is a publicly funded program and we want to make sure that it's benefiting the montgomery county residents who are making it possible so community impact and engagement is looking at how well your organization seems to understand the community you serve, um, how well you've defined the audience you want to reach with this particular project, and then how you're going to engage and impact that audience. Um, and again, your audience could be very large if you're doing a community festival. Your project might have very broad, large impact. You're going to have 500 or thousands of people who come to this event and have an enriching arts experience. But your audience could also be very small. And some of the most impactful projects that we've seen in past cycles, um, they might have been happening in only one classroom in a school, but the organization understood exactly who the students were in that classroom and they had a really clear plan to help them reach specific learning objectives for example um, so as long as you have clear goals and a clear understanding of your audience that's really what we're looking for here and then the last scoring area that they look at is the ability to complete and manage the project which is just what it sounds like so here panelists are looking at the quality of your project plan the application will ask you to complete a timeline, so you're going to give in detail, uh, whether it's week to week or month to month, how you're going to make your project happen, and they want to see that you've really thought through everything that needs to happen for this project to be successful. They're also going to look at that budget that I showed you to make sure it's balanced, it seems realistic, you have all of your bases covered, uh, and then they'll look at supporting documentation where they'll learn more about who the individuals are who are actually managing the project to see if they seem like they're qualified and can get it done. Um, again, grants are competitive, so not all applications will receive funding and not all applications that receive funding will get the full uh, grant requested. So you want to be thinking about your application um, from an outside perspective. How is someone who is not familiar with your organization and doesn't know anything about your project yet, how are they going to read this application and what are the things that are going to stand out to them that will make them feel really good about your proposal or where will they have maybe questions or concerns? concerns. If you're applying in the capacity building project category, the scoring will be just a little bit different, um, simply because, again, the, the projects are they're a, a little bit of a different animal than something like a festival or a community event or a public art piece. Here, your project is very inward focused. Um, so it, you might feel like, well, I don't know if my project has a community impact because it's basically going to involve my staff and my board. Um, so the way that we think about those areas for capacity building projects have more to do with how the project is going to make you again more effective at your arts and cultural mission. So for that community impact and engagement area, your project might not actually be engaging the public um, in the sense that you have community members involved in the project itself, but maybe your capacity building project is going to make you better able to connect with community members down the line. So again, going back to that example of something like a website overhaul, if right now you're making amazing arts and cultural uh, experiences, but nobody knows about them, a capacity building project to overhaul your website and your marketing plan is going to enable you to uh, connect more community members with the arts and cultural work that you're doing. So each of these scoring areas is spelled out in detail in the program guidelines. And this is a document that you should have by your side at every stage of the application process. So I want to make sure you know where it is. So if you go back to that cultureworks.org uh, website and you go to again apply for funding and then we go to special projects grants we have some goodies here for you to refer to through every phase of the application and the first one that you should take a look at is the full guidelines document so it's linked right here pardon me for a moment
Okay. And this document covers a lot of what uh, I've discussed today and even more in some areas. So if you scroll down to page seven, this is where we give you a full overview of the scoring criteria in the hopes that this will help um, help you shape your, your responses in your application. So it's broken into those three scoring areas that I just mentioned. And then under each area, we give you the exact language that the panelists have in their scoring rubric. So for project quality and artistic vibrancy, they are looking at the quality of the artistic or cultural event that's happening. They're looking at the qualifications of the artistic and creative personnel, and you can see that spelled out here. And then we tell you where they get this information in the application. Uh, and then we also tell you what counts as a really strong score in this area or what counts as a good score or a weak score in need of improvement. So as you're working on your application, use this criteria overview and look at the descriptions in each scoring area of what makes a strong or exceptional application and use this to ask yourself, is my application um, meeting each of these descriptions? Am I answering the questions that are spelled out here? So um, for example, artistic and creative personnel are highly qualified and have been confirmed. In your application, you'll have a space where you can provide resumes and biographical statements for any artists or other creatives who are involved in the project. So that's where panelists will be looking to, uh, to evaluate this. And if possible, um, make sure that you have uh, as many of the project participants confirmed and, and on deck ready to go as possible. I won't go through each one of these because, again, it's probably more, more fun to read on your own. Um, but I do want to highlight at the bottom of this, or at the end of this guidelines document, there is a page called your application checklist. And this is kind of a cheat sheet for you so that you can be uh, thinking as you're getting ready to apply about the types of questions that you'll be responding to and the types of supporting documents that we'll ask for in your application. And do not have sticker shock looking at this page. It looks like a lot, but when you really get into it, most of this is stuff that you're going to have um, easily on hand, like your IRS letter of determination and marketing samples and things like that. But I do want to draw your attention to um, these two items because they come up every year in the panel meeting. These are supporting documents that are not required, but they are strongly encouraged. And the first one is those letters of commitment from the artists and creative personnel. Um, so if you're hiring artists to work on the project with you, try to get some kind of a letter or even an informal email from those artists where they're expressing that they know about the project, they're excited about the project, and they want to be involved in it. Um, we totally understand that when you're waiting to hear whether you've been awarded funding or not, you might want to hold off on getting artists and other, other individuals under contract. That's completely reasonable. Um, but if you can show that at least the individuals you want to work with know that the project is happening and that they want to be a part of it if you receive grant funding, that can go a long way to building the panelists' confidence that your project is going to happen and be successful. So try to get those letters if you can. And similarly, letters demonstrating commitment or support from project partners. So some examples of this would be if you're planning to do something like a public mural and you want to put the mural on the side of, uh, of a building that's owned by a local business, if you can get a letter from that local business saying that they know that you want to do that and that they love the idea, um, that's great because that way that immediately answers any questions or concerns panelists have about, you know, are you allowed to do this? Do you have the permits? All of that. Um, and also, if your organization is going to be collaborating with another organization, it can be really helpful to have some kind of a letter from that collaborator saying again that they're they're uh, ready to help out with this project so optional but strongly encouraged and then the other item that I'll draw your attention to is the uh, the work samples so you can upload 
up to two. And the type of work sample is going to depend on what kind of organization you are and what kind of project you're planning on doing. So usually organizations will submit things like images. Um, video is great. If you're doing a performance, you could provide something like a, a video of a performer that you plan to work with doing, you know, something from the past to show the quality of, of their performances. Um, or it could be something like a selection of manuscripts, or maybe even something out of an annual report that's describing a program that you've done in the past. So again, we're pretty flexible in the types of work samples, but we have some more clear and specific guidance on the CultureWorks website that you can take a look at if you want uh, to know how people usually handle work samples uh, in their applications. All right. So a quick refresher on the next steps coming up. Um, if you have a bit of a project idea, but you're not sure whether it's in line with what this program is looking for or not, then join us for one of the project ideation sessions that are kicking off next week. Uh, they're happening on February 15th and 22nd. And I'll put that into the chat here in a moment so you know where to sign up for it. Then get that intent to apply ready. The deadline is going to be on March 3rd at 4 p.m. through that EC Impact website. And we have a sample application uh, posted in that special project section of our website that I showed you earlier right now. So at any point, you don't have to wait until you find out whether you can complete the full application. You can start uh, working on it at any time. We want to make sure you, you feel like you have lots of time to work on it and polish it. So you can get started now. And I would highly recommend, even though, again, it's not required, to start working on getting some of those letters of commitment and support if you can. Then in late March, we'll let you know whether your intent to apply is eligible to move to the next phase of application. And at that time, we'll send you the link to the full application and some instructions to get started. And then uh, you can submit a draft for review by April 12th if you'd like to take advantage of that opportunity. And then you'll submit your application by April 26th at 4 p.m. That's it uh, in a nutshell. So at this time, I'm going to give you some time to collect your thoughts and, and keep sending questions in that Q&A box. And someone asked if the slides will be available. And yes, I will post the slides on the website as well. And again, once I have the video up on the website, I'll send all of you and anybody who registered the link so that you know that it's there. The last thing that I want to mention is not about the special projects grant, but it's about another opportunity that just opened up that I want you to be aware of. The Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District just opened uh, a new grant program called the Community Mini Grant. And these are grants of up to $1,000. Let me get the description so I get it right. So the purpose of the Community Mini Grant is to support grassroots, minority, neighborhood, and small organization efforts to utilize arts and culture to strengthen community. Um, so if you have a project in mind that maybe it's a smaller scale uh, and you don't feel like the special projects grant is the right fit for you, or maybe the project is happening sooner than the special projects grant is going to award funding, check out this new community mini grant program. Um, these are designed to be pretty quick turnaround grants. So there's a rolling deadline, you can apply for the funding as long as there is funding available. Uh, the MCACD is going to review the applications on a quarterly basis uh, and turn that funding around quickly. So Really, you just have to apply for the funding at least 90 days before your event is going to happen. And again, you can uh, request up to $1,000. So there's more information about that grant program on the website that I put there at the bottom of the slides. But check it out. It's a new opportunity. It's exciting. And we want to see lots of groups take advantage of it. All right. Another question that I saw, that, oh, this. Great question. So someone asked, can the fiscal agent be outside of Montgomery County? Yes, 
Great question. Um, so your organization who's actually doing the project needs to be a Montgomery County organization. But if you're working with a fiscal agent, they can be from anywhere. Excellent question. All right, I'm going to hang on so that you can keep asking questions, but for those of you who feel like you're ready to go, uh, I just want to thank you again for joining me today, and I, uh, I hope to see an application from you. If you have any questions at any point, please reach out to me. Let me put my email address in here so you know where to reach me. It's kmainer at cultureworks.org. Don't be shy about asking questions. That's what we're here for. We want you to um, feel confident going into the application phase, and we will do uh, everything that we can to assist. So let me stop sharing. There we go. So thank you so much for being here. Feel free to sign off, go get some lunch. Please stay healthy out there, and I'll hang on for a few more minutes um, so that the rest of you can keep asking questions. Thank you so much.